Uh, so we, today we have Mike Franklin, who's here from UC Berkeley. Uh, so I'm very happy that he's here and, and I get to introduce him. Uh, he is Thomas Siebel Professor uh, in Berkeley. He's also the chair of the department, uh, so the co-head or the head of the AMP Lab and the Institute for Data Science there. Uh, he's been in industry off and on uh, and in academia off and on. Uh, and so uh, he's got a lot of insight about things like big data and data science and he's going to share that. He promises it's not going to be too technical a talk. Uh, so he won't displace the information you're trying to store for your exams. Uh, and so it's a real pleasure to have him here. Uh, for those of you who are PhD students wondering why you're going to academia, so that somebody can stand up and say, this is my former student, uh, my job here is done, and I'm retired after this talk. So, <laughs> All right, well, thanks for having me here. If, there, if there's time at the end of the talk, I am open to telling Mike Carey stories. <laughs> Um, so yeah, great. So, so, so as Mike said, um, it's not a technical talk, really, in any way. Um, basically, what happened was I, I was asked to give um, some talks to uh, things like the uh, Computer Research uh, Association, the CRA, uh, and uh, then at NSF headquarters and a few places like that um, about about data science and uh, and big data, and so. Um, so it's kind of a, a bit of a political talk, and there's a there's a there's a few political messages here. Um, the first one you can tell is really by the title, which is, um, you know, there's a lot of excitement, there's a lot of buzz, there's a lot of hype, there's a lot of noise around these terms, big data and data science. Um, and as academics, a lot of us, our our instinct is when that happens, is to kind of run the other way. And so, um, you know, message number one is don't do that. And I'll try to explain why I think that's important. And then the other, which is a little more uh, political and a little more maybe uh, kind of parochial, I don't know what the right word is. Um, but you know, there's a real question of where this stuff lives in a, in a modern university. Um, as a computer scientist, it occurred, and, and somebody who studied databases with Mike, uh, it, it was obvious to me that this stuff lived in computer science, and particularly in the data-oriented parts of computer science. Uh, and I was a little shocked when I started talking to my colleagues around campus, and they didn't share that view. And so the other, the other, you know, issue is is sort of you know raising this question of what's the right what's the right way to do this at a, at a university. So let me just jump into it. I'll you know just uh, give you some motivations. I'll try to put a couple definitions on big data and data science because it's a little hard to talk about them without some definitions. And then both mostly I'm just going to talk about some of my experiences at, at Berkeley uh, in the area. So, okay, but first I'll start with my data story. Um, so, uh, I've been teaching databases for a long time, uh, you know, at least 20 years. And, you know, there's a, a great uh, history of database systems that had tremendous impact on industry. Uh, and there's a lot of, um, you know, good uh, practical experience in databases, as well as a lot of really important uh, and useful theory behind it. And so, you know, over the 20 years of teaching this stuff to, to students, um, I would invariably get this kind of reaction to all this wonderful uh, science. And, um, and so that's great. And I, I just sort of got used to that and figured out that that's how life was going to be. Um, a few years ago, I started teaching a, a course called Data Science with uh, this guy here, Jeff Hollebacher. And, um, you know, basically, we agreed we were going to teach this course. We had no idea what it was going to be, there was no syllabus. Um, we just uh, said, okay, let's do a data science course in the fall. We put it on the books. It was called Introduction to Data Science. Jeff's name wasn't even on it because he wasn't officially, uh, you know, on the faculty. And, you know, the first day of registration, uh, you know, it, the, the course filled up. Nobody could get in. People were banging on the door, let me into this class. I'm like, you don't even know what it is. I don't even know what it is. <laughs> and so, you know, so that was my first kind of hint that maybe something big was happening here. So that's my teaching story. You know, on the research side, again, I've been doing you know, data systems and, and architectures for data management for, for years and years and years. And you, know, you would go out um, and, and, and talk to people about this, and you would often get this type of reaction, uh, even from places that should know better, like uh, the National Science Foundation and DARPA and places like that. Uh, there's a lot of pushback saying, hey, this stuff is really practical. And, and you know, uh, that was actually code for this isn't researchy enough uh, because there's so much of it going on in, in industry. 
okay, so you know, roll the clock forward. Now I'm you know, not pitching you know, data management, I'm pitching big data. Um, and I start getting reactions like this. Uh, so, so again, you know, clearly, clearly, you know, something's going on here because the work wasn't really that much different. Okay, so, um, so that's my story. So that sort of leads you to wonder, well, okay, so what's, what's the big deal, right? Why are people so excited uh, about this stuff? So um, you might be familiar, many of you are, I'm sure, with the, the, the Gartner hype cycle, which is, you know, a new idea, a new technology, uh, gets announced, uh, you know, people get wildly excited about it. At some point, somebody says, oh, you know, the emperor has no clothes, this stuff isn't good for anything. There's this, you know, huge plummet in excitement. This is called the trough of disillusionment. And then eventually people, you know, you get past the hype and, and you figure out um, what the stuff is really good for and then you end up with more, um, you know, you, more reasonable expectations. And so that's the Gartner hype cycle, and, and if you, you know, look that up, you'll see they've kind of gone through um, you know, a bunch of different technologies and, and argue how they've all followed some version of this curve. You know, if you look at things like deep learning or something, they're kind of up here right now. Um, but you know, the, the question is, um, you know, what, about, what about, say, big data? So where's that? So when I did this talk initially uh, last summer, the first thing I did is I went to Google, I typed in big data, and the first two things it showed me were, were ads for things like big data for dummies and big data for non-geeks. And I said, okay, well, given that, we've got to be you know, somewhere approaching the peak of this hype cycle, right? Because once the dummies book comes out, you know, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a pretty good indication that you know, you're, you're pretty far along the hype cycle. Um, but you know, again, the point is, is, is so I, it's true, it's a lot of hype and there's a lot of noise. We've got to get past that um, because there's really important reasons for why people are excited about this and why it is going to make a big difference, not only in industry, but also across uh, academia and across research. So, um, okay, so um, data, data analysis has been around for a long time. You know, you can go back as far as you want, but, you know, experimental design, quality control, you know, all the way, you know, through the previous century. Um, and so, um, you know, the idea of doing anything with, doing something with data isn't really a new, new idea. Um, but what's happening, and I think the reason why, in a nutshell, there's so much excitement around this stuff, is, is really that it's, the, the, the data is coming from everywhere now. So in just about any field you can think of, it's become increasingly easy, and in some cases unavoidable, uh, to just collect huge amounts of, of information about what's going on. And so, you know, a lot of the commercial excitement, of course, happened with, uh, you know, online, uh, you know, anything that you do on the web, as you know, you know, you bring up a web page, you click on a, a link or an ad, you watch a video, you know, there's this entire cascade of, 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 uh, uh, of, of data that gets generated when you, when you do that. You know, throughout networks that you didn't even know you were on, you know, read by companies that you didn't even know existed. Um, and, you know, it's just like every time you click, you know, there's this explosion of data. So, um, you know, that's one place where this is happening. Of course, a lot of companies believe and, and many of us have shown that there's, you know, there's real value in, in some of that data. If you can understand what people are trying to do and, and what, what they want. Um, you know, another place where a lot of data is coming from is this idea of user-generated content. So, uh, you know, people are now able to, you know, you know quickly tweet out a, a message, write a blog, take a picture, put up a video, whatever. So lots of data being generated just by people, uh, you know, doing their normal normal thing, walking around and with devices and so on. Um, emerging interest and continued interest in, in sort of machine to machine communication and so some people call this the Internet of Things. So as um, you know, the world becomes increasingly instrumented, as the devices we put out in the world become connected to the Internet and, and capable of collecting and, 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 and transmitting data, um, there's huge amounts of, of information that's going to be created this way. And what's interesting is, you know, these top two are sort of driven by people. So you can sort of think of the amount of data there as being sort of proportional to the number of, of people connected to the Internet. Um, you know, the machine-to-machine -machine stuff isn't bounded by people at all. And so in, in theory, this could grow a lot faster and a lot bigger than some of these other uh, areas. And then finally, especially for those of us at universities, scientific computing. Um, and so if you look around campus, whether it's, you know, life sciences, physical sciences, social sciences, uh, even the humanities, um, you know, all fields are becoming more and more data-driven. 
And this graph here, it's a little hard, to, I'm sure it's very hard to see, uh, but the only thing to know, it's a, it's a timeline, it's a log scale. Uh, this boring straight line is Moore's Law, so that's how much faster, optimistically, computers are getting every year um, over time. Uh, this line here that's just kind of dropping through the floor, that's the cost of sequencing genomes. Um, and so if you're doing genomics work, you know, this gap is basically how much slower your computers are getting every year uh, for the amount of, of data you need to process. So, you know, huge fundamental problems that need to be solved, you know, not just by the scientists that are trying to do this work, but by people who, who build, are building uh, the, the, the computer infrastructure and the software infrastructure to, to process this data. So, you know, in a nutshell, this slide is, is trying to show why there's so much excitement about data. It's just because it's everywhere and it impacts pretty much uh, anything you can think about doing. Um, so, um, and this is just for people at universities, uh, you know, Jim Gray, famous uh, database uh, person uh, and, and, and uh, scientist in general, um, you know, postulated that we're, science is moving, you know, had moved through these four different uh, paradigms that initially, you know, you would, uh, you know, point a telescope up at the sky and you'd see what was going on. Uh, and then there, uh, science moved to more of a, a theoretical mode where, you know, you would theorize about the universe and then you'd look for evidence that, that proved or disproved your theories. Uh, more recently, if you think about high performance computing, uh, there's a lot of simulation based work and, and, and doing science by building huge computer models and running them. And the argument now is that uh, science is moving into this new paradigm, this fourth paradigm, which is basically collect a bunch of data and start processing that data, mine the data, look at that data, and see what it's telling you about the world. Okay, so uh, from in the university perspective, I think this is why there's so much uh, excitement about this stuff on campus. And that's the, the fourth paradigm, this nice book that Microsoft uh, put out that's available for free online uh, about this. So, um, you know, there's a lot of excitement going on, um, obviously coming from the funding agencies, so these are the National uh, Academy of Sciences report that uh, Mike Jordan from my department uh, put together. Uh, I was on the committee, a few other people, a bunch of other people. You know, a bunch of other things coming out of uh, the, the academies. Uh, you know, the Presidential Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. Uh, this was uh, the announcement for uh, the Obama administration's Big Data Research Initiative, uh, where uh, the White House came out and said, directed the agencies to start putting money into uh, research on these topics, and, and that continues. So lots of excitement nationally. And so, you know, I, when I started putting this talk together, I said, okay, well, you know, if I look around the Berkeley campus, where is big data happening, right? This was the other message I was talking about. You know, it's not just happening, you know, in the database group of, of, of the computer science department, right? And so this is just a little survey, and, and I didn't really update it very very recently. But if you look around, um, you know, I'll talk about the AMP lab. That's in the EECS department. That's the, the lab that I run. Um, the stats department has been uh, teaching data science courses about reproducibility, and, and you'd expect that. Um, the information school, we have an iSchool at Berkeley. They were smart enough to go out and grab the Berkeley dot, uh, the, I'm sorry, data science dot berkeley.edu domain, and if you search for data science in Berkeley, this ad will follow you around the internet uh, for, for months. Um, so they have a master's program in, in, in data science. Um, a bunch of different institutes on campus, Simons Institute is a theory institute, Citrus is a information technology for society, also a big institute, they're running this data and democracy program. Uh, the social, science, uh, social scientists got together and put together something called the D-Lab, the data lab. Uh, to help social scientists uh, get access to tools that they needed to, to, to work with data. Uh, the astronomy department has been teaching Python boot camps. Uh, and then this new thing uh, that, that I'll talk a little bit about, oh, I'm sorry, the law school uh, has been doing a bunch of computational law as well as looking, I mean, so, you know, actually using computers to do law as well as looking at the legal implications of big data and data science. And then um, this thing that I'll talk a little bit about called the Berkeley Institute for Data Science is a new sort of cross-campus uh, cross uh, uh, effort that uh, was part of the, a bigger thing called, called the more Sloan uh, Data Science Environments, uh, I forget what they call it, Data Science Environments Program. Uh, they did basically a national competition uh, and they picked three schools, us, Washington, and uh, NYU, uh, to house these centers 
that are supposed to be uh, collection points for data science uh, information and, uh, and data scientists on campus. So I'll talk more about that. But the point is, uh, if you're a computer scientist, and I know um, I was a little nervous when Mike asked to give this talk because actually organizationally, you guys are, I think, out in front of just about everybody else uh, in terms of how would you set up the right group of, of people and departments uh, to try to attack some of these data science problems. And so, um, you know, this might not actually not be as big an issue for you guys as it, as it is for, for us at Berkeley trying to do this stuff. But, you know, um, you know when, I, when I looked at this, I mean, it was pretty clear that data science isn't just a, a branch of computer science or just a branch of statistics, uh, and it shouldn't be, right? Uh, you know, everybody needs this stuff and everybody wants to contribute to this stuff. So that's, you know, that's the opportunity and that's the challenge is how do you make that happen? Okay, so that's kind of by way of, of, of background. Like I said, there's not gonna be much technical stuff. So, um, so let me just try a little bit of, of, of definitions, uh, partly because some of them are fun and partly because it's useful to do. So, so first I'll start with data science. So there's a bunch of good data science definitions out there. Um, the sexiest job of the 21st century. Uh, there's a Harvard Business Review article about this. I think most people know that Hal Varian, several years before that, said that statistics was going to be the sexiest job of the 21st century. Uh, so give Hal some credit for that. Uh, this is a nice one. Data science is a statistician who lives in San Francisco. Uh, some, some truth to that. Um, this is Josh Wills from uh, Cloud, the head of data science at Cloudera, one of the big data companies out there. It's a person who's uh, better stats than any software engineer and better than so at software than any statistician. Right. So um, this one is a little, this one's a little more serious, and it, and it gets at, at, at you know what I think is going on here. So Hillary Mason, who uh, was chief scientist at Bidley, I think she's moved on from that position now. Uh, but she's uh, one of the main people uh, in the data science community in New York City. Um, you know, she says a data scientist is someone who can obtain, scrub, explore, model, and interpret data, basically bringing all these things together. And this starts to get, to, for me, to a, def a better definition of what data science is about. I would add a few things to this. In particular, uh, what she doesn't have here is, um, is communicating the results of your analysis, right? Because a big part of what you have to do as a data scientist is you know, do the number crunching, but then use what you've learned to actually help somebody make a decision or help yourself make a decision. And so that involves communication and, and a bunch of other things behind it. But what this starts getting at, and, and this is the way I've been thinking about data science, is it, it, it's really not a single action or, or a single thing that you do, but just like software engineering is an entire life cycle going from you know, trying to figure out what it is that you want to build, what it really needs to do, how to design it, and then you know how to build it, how to test it, how to maintain it. Same thing with data science. You've got you know a question that you're trying to answer or a decision you're trying to make. You need to figure out what what's the right data to help you do that. How do I get it? How do I then uh, take that data and put it into a format that, that I can actually use? Because as you know, the data that you find in the wild is typically you know unusable or very hard to work with. You know, and then how do I actually you know do the inference and do the analysis? And then you know how do I how do I communicate those results? How do I understand those results and communicate them? And then in the longer term, you know, how do I, how do I keep those, as the data is changing, you know, how do I A, maintain the data itself, and B, how do I make sure that the answers I'm giving are still valid, right? So what this definition starts to get at for data science is it's not a single, it's not a single point operation. It, it's an entire life cycle, um, just like a lot of other engineering types of processes are. Okay, so that's the best definition I have right now for data science. There might be better ones out there. If you know them, send them my way. Um, let's talk about big data. So big data is a little harder. Um, if you look for a, a definition for big data online, you'll get something like this. Uh, lots, you know, uh, data sets consisting of billions or trillions of records that are just really hard to work with. Okay, and this is really, a, 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 I believe, a very uh, terrible definition of big data. Uh, it's understandable why you might come up with a definition like this because big data starts with the word big. <laughs> uh, so it, it's, it makes sense. But I think it misses a lot. So, you know, the simplest thing I don't like about this, 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 um, up, this definition is just operationalizing it. So, you know, the way I look at this, if you have a billion minus one records in your database, does that mean you don't have big data? <laughs> right? It's it just it's nonsensical. 
right? But there's a deeper problem with this definition, which is, <laughs> there's, a bigger, there's a bigger problem with this definition, which is um, it poses data as a problem, right? I've got all this data, and now I have to do something with it. And oh no, now you're giving me more data. You know, my problem just got harder. And that's exactly the wrong way to think about this, right? Data is a resource, right? It's, it's not a load. It's not, a, it's not something you have to get rid of. It's, it's a resource. And so, you know, as you get more data, right, just like as you get more resources, at least to a point, it should be a good thing. So, you know, can you come up with a definition that, that gets at that aspect of big data? So I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to. <laughs> but, I, but, but this is kind of an interesting thing that, that starts getting you there. So this is from a, a, a little book that the O'Reilly people put out. They're, they've been doing a lot of the writing, uh, at least on the industrial side, about big data and, and data science. So they did a pamphlet on how data science is, is changing healthcare. And it's a, it's a really interesting quote. It says that for a long time we thought, uh, you know, uh, tamoxifen, uh, you know, this treatment was roughly 80% effective for breast cancer patients. Uh, but now we know much more than, than that. We know that it's 100% effective for about 80% of the people, and it's completely ineffective in the rest, okay? Which, if you think about it, is an incredibly flip <laughs> statement. But if you think about it a little more, it's actually a very deep statement, right? Because what it's saying is that if you can collect enough of the right data, right, so you need volume, right, you need to collect more and more instances, uh, at the right amount of of detail and granularity, so you have need the right number of features and, and so on. Um, you can figure out for a treatment like this, you know, exactly who it's going to work for and exactly who it's not going to work for. And for the people that it's going to work for, you can then give them that treatment. And for the people it's not going to work for, you can then try to find something else that's going to help them. Okay, so if you think about that, you know, especially in, in this kind of clinical trial scenario, if you could come up with a, a treatment for a drug that maybe would only helped a couple percentage of the people solve, solve, you know, cure a horrible disease, but you could tell exactly who it was going to help, that's a huge deal. And if you don't have enough data at the right granularity, you just can't know that, right? If you're just taking averages and, 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 and sort of very coarse data over small samples, you just won't learn enough to be able to, 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 to take advantage of, of, of those sorts of drugs. And if you think about it, you know, in other areas, it, uh, that sort of starts getting at, 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 at what's interesting about, about big data, okay? So we learned this kind of the hard way at Berkeley. Um, we were trying to do research on big data. We didn't have big data. So we said, okay, well, how do we go out and collect data? And we said, all right, well, maybe if we built an application and then collect data about it, we'd be able to collect enough data that we could, we could do some interesting experiments. So, we built this thing called Carrot, which is still out there. It's actually not run by us anymore. It's sort of it's turned a little bit into nagware when you run it. But basically what you do is you put it on your smartphone. It watches uh, what applications you're running. It watches what happens to the battery on your smartphone. And then periodically just uploads that stuff to our application that is running uh, in the cloud. And then um, based on the information that it's getting from the smartphones, it builds models. And um, it then uses those models to understand how different applications uh, affect the battery on different, different smartphones, okay? So, you know, when we started this, we, we ran it, you know, everyone in the lab put it on their phone, so we had about 60 or 70 phones, and it worked, it was great. It didn't really tell you anything useful, but it worked. Um, being the industrious uh, people that our students are, uh, they kind of used their social networks and, and they got the word out about this application. In particular, it got written up in TechCrunch. And it was, it was actually interesting because I was in China when this happened and somebody sent me a, a link to an article on TechCrunch about something completely different. And when I went to the TechCrunch page, there's a thing at the top, at least it used to be, it says trend, currently trending on TechCrunch. And it said, you know, Berkeley's Amp Lab reduces, you know, releases Carrot application. I'm like, what's going on here? So anyway, so it, 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 it got on TechCrunch, it went viral, uh, it got downloaded over a single weekend by, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand people, and this thing just died a horrible death. It was terrible. <laughs> uh, we ended up with terrible rank, rankings on, you know, in the App Store, and, you know. Anyway, so we rebuilt it, we got, we got that, but, so the interesting thing, though, is when you run it on 70 phones, you don't see anything. But if you have smart students who know how to get stuff out into the real world, you get it downloaded on, say, a million phones, which we did over time, all of a sudden you start seeing really interesting stuff. So you can then, for each individual user, if you run this thing, what it'll do is it'll tell you, well, okay, 
boy, you know, you're really bad at using the battery on your device. You're in the 12th percentile of, of people that have your device in terms of how long your battery lasts. But here's a bunch of things you could think about doing that will improve your battery life, right? So, you know, you run Pandora, and it turns out that, you know, when we look over our million users and we see people who have your version of the phone with your version of that operating system that run Pandora, their battery dry, drains really quickly. So if you stop running Pandora, we predict your battery would last an extra hour and a half every day. Okay? Well, how do we know that? It's because, well, we've seen a bunch of people that look exactly like you, except they're not running Pandora. Right? And so again, you collect enough information. Um, and by the way, if this is being recorded, I got nothing against Pandora. That's just the first example there. <laughs> I'm a happy Pandora user. Uh, anyway, um, you know, but it, it's giving you, um, you know, it sees enough examples of situations that look like yours that are a little bit different that it can start building these models. And the other thing you can do, so that's kind of the haystack, right? Everybody has this problem. You can also do the needle thing, which is you can say, hey, you know, you know, every time you run, you know, Google Maps, let's say, which I also am a happy user of, um, your battery drains really fast. But everyone else who, you know, most people who have your phone and run Google Maps don't have that problem. So maybe you should uninstall Google Maps and reinstall it, okay? And so again, this is that definition of big data as a resource. If you do it with just a few people, you get no interesting information. You hit this tipping point where you've got enough examples at sufficient detail that you can start making very detailed uh, recommendations back to people about you know, what they can be doing for their particular situation. So to me, that, you know, it's a long definition. I've got to shorten it a little bit. But to me, that's kind of the opportunity. That's what big data is about. If you, if you don't have enough data to do that, then, you, then you've got small data. And once you hit the tipping point, you've got big data. Yes, sir? Mike, how much battery did the carrot itself take? I know. Everyone's <laughs> a wise guy. How, the question is, how much, how much battery does carrot take? And the answer is very little, of course. Thank you very much. But, but when everybody hated us, when everyone hated us at the beginning, because our system didn't work, one of the things that got out in the interwebs was that, hey, this thing's eating my battery. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway. Okay. So that's, that's the definition of big data. Okay. So, you know, regardless of how you define these things, I think it's important to realize that, that, that things have, have fundamentally changed, right? If, if you look at how data management was done even five years ago to how it's done today and how it's going to be done five years down the road, it looks completely different. And so, I mean, you know, if you don't like the big data term or whatever, it doesn't matter. Things have really changed. So, you know, people have figured out how to scale um, processing and storage, okay? And, you know, you can now start with the system and, and, and grow it, okay? And that was really hard to do. Most people couldn't do that before. Now it's just commodity. More importantly, if you think about things like, you know, public cloud computing, you can, it's elastic, right? So you can use what you need. So if you're trying to solve a big problem, you can go out and rent the, rent the resources to solve that problem. And then when you're done, you can give those resources up and you don't have to pay for them anymore. In the old days, if you, want, if you, you had to size your data center for the biggest pro possible problem, you could think about attacking. Okay, and then you wanted to be a little optimistic, so you build it you know, some percentage bigger than that. Right? And that stopped a lot of people from making any progress because the, the cost of entry was just too high. Now that's not true. You build it and then you scale it. And if you need to surge for a little bit, you surge and then you get those resources and then you give them up. So pay as you go. Elastic computing, fundamentally changing the way people are working with data. Similar thing is the way that you think about structuring your data. So in the old days, like people like Mike used to give us these schemas where you know, the first step number one was figure out every piece of data you might ever want to store in your database. Step number two, figure out exactly how each one of those pieces is related to all the other pieces. Okay, great. You got all that done? Okay, great. Now start loading data. Okay, and most people never made it past step one. Those that did hardly ever made it past step two, right? It is just too much upfront cost. Same as here. So now you don't have to do that. Now there are these things called data lakes. Uh, we can talk about that a little later. Uh, you know, but the, 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 now the idea is collect the data. We have scalable storage, so it doesn't cost much to store it. Collect everything you can, and then now start imposing structure on it. Start figuring out what's in there so you can use it. Okay, so a very different way of doing business. Completely different than the way it used to be. Um, then these are the, you know, uh, well, I'll talk about this in a second, but, you know, 
it's now a lot easier to sort of move in a single system uh, between search, query, and, and machine learning, things like that. You don't have to move from one system to another if you don't want to. So there's you know, sort of more modalities of working with the data that are easy to get to. Um, there's a variety of languages. So you know, if you like SQL, you can use that. If you like R, you can use that. If you like Python, you can use that. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then the one that I, I want to emphasize to this crowd is this last one, which is if you look at where a lot of this innovation is happening in the big data space, it's all happening in open source, right? What's driving the innovation isn't sort of the traditional big companies like Oracle and IBM and you know, uh, companies like that, but it's really um, being driven by people that are putting out systems and software in the open source and then those things getting brought in and adopted and, and commercialized and, and hardened and whatever by some of those companies, okay, as well as a bunch of new companies. All right? So, and, and this is really important for us as people at universities because that means we can play, right? In the old days, as a database researcher, what I would do is I'd come up with a new algorithm, I'd write a paper about it, it would get rejected by some graduate student somewhere. <laughs> eventually, I would figure out how to, uh, eventually, it would get into a conference or, or a paper somewhere. And then you know three people would read it, and then um, you know what I would do is I would because I was ambitious as I would go visit Oracle and IBM and these places and I'd say hey look at my great new joint algorithm and they'd go oh hmm okay and then that was it I mean maybe they used it maybe they didn't I have no idea but that's not the way it works anymore now we write the software and my students write the software we put it out there we go out we get users we help people use it and then we build a community and that's all uh, allowed because of open source. So we sort of cut out the middleman, right? And then those companies come to us and say, hey, how do we use this stuff? Which is a much better situation to be in. So, you know, whether or not you like the hype or the names or whatever, the definitions, if you're doing data management, with a, which a lot of you are, it's a whole new world out there. And that's great, right? Because it's just tremendous opportunity. Okay, so I'm gonna sort of go quickly over a little bit about what we've been doing at Berkeley on the research side, and then I wanna spend a little more time on the education side because I think that dovetails with a lot more of what's going on here you know, in the data science initiative and so on. All right, so I'm gonna brag a little bit, sorry. Uh, but we built, this, we built this thing called AMP Lab. We started it about four years ago. Uh, and what's interesting about AMP Lab is it's a collaboration of a bunch of these people. It's run by myself, um, database guy Mike Jordan, who's a machine learning person, Jan Stoika, who's a systems, a systems guy. Uh, and but involves people from uh, you know Ken, Ken Goldberg does robotics and crowdsourcing you know Anthony does security uh, you know more machine learning and systems people networking and so on so the idea was we got a bunch of people who wanted to work on a problem together we built we said okay let's 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 decide to work on uh, you know this big data problem it wasn't called that at the time um, and let's agree to work on it for say five years okay so that's what we did we started the AMP lab AMP stands for the three resources that we believe you need to combine to be able to make sense of big data. So for the A is algorithms, and that's machine learning, statistical methods, and so on. The M is machines, so that's how you exploit clusters, large clusters, and cloud computing. And the P is people. And um, our original thoughts there were really around human computation in the crowd. So if you look at one of the things that was happening uh, as we were putting the lab together, was it systems like Mechanical Turk and, and uh, you know, Odesk and, and some of these you know, human computation platforms were starting to get a lot of traction. And we realized that you know, algorithms and machines put together can only take you so far for a given analytics problem. There's going to be a bunch of things that people are still better at. And, and depending on which of these people you look at, you know, that line is in a different place. It, you know, but, but everyone agreed that there are still things uh, that at least today you know, you can't do just with algorithms and machines. So the idea was, okay, how do we bring in people uh, to help collect the data that we need to answer the problem, to disambiguate the questions that people are trying to ask, and to sort of get those, you know, those higher percentile answers that the algorithms aren't quite able to get yet. Okay, and the idea was we were gonna put all these things together into a single system uh, for solving the big data problem. So that's the AMP lab. Um, when we started, our plan was to, to fund it almost actually really exclusively with industry uh, support. So um, Google, Amazon, and SAP, actually Google first, then SAP, then Amazon, uh, all signed up at the very beginning and said, yeah, we love this, we're going to support it. Um, and then um, over time, we went out and, and engaged with other companies 
And so we've now got um, you know, this list of, I think, 28 or 29 companies now that sponsor the work um, and that um, you know, give us feedback on a regular basis. We just last week had one of our uh, semi-annual uh, retreats. So we go off for two and a half days. People from all these companies come. All the students present their work. And then we get feedback, formal feedback, from people from all these companies about which projects they liked, which projects they didn't like. Um, things that they are facing on a daily basis that they would like us to work on that we don't seem to be working on, you know, opportunities for collaboration and so on. So we have a really nice back and forth with, with you know, some of the best companies in the world that do this sort of stuff. And in the meantime, the funding agencies got excited about big data and so we were able to, to get involved in some of those pro uh, projects as well. So we were able to get uh, uh, an NSF expedition awards and so on. So where we ended up was kind of a nice 50-50 split between government funding and industry funding, um, which it's really hard to, to pull that off. And again, you know, you could look at big data and say that's a lot of hype, or you could look at big data and say, boy, all these people are interested in that. Maybe they'll help us do research on it, which is kind of the approach we took. So okay, so that's what we look like. And what we're building is this thing called the Berkeley Data Analytics Stack. Who here knows it's, it's the, the abbreviation is bad. Oh, I said it, never mind. It's BDAS, we pronounce it badass. <laughs> <laughs> People sort of know that. Okay, and, and if you look at badass, these are the layers that make it up. And I'll show you, a, un, unfortunately, a more detailed version of this in a second. But you know, at the bottom, we've done work on you know, resource virtualization. So there's a system called Mesos that we built. Um, it's now out in the open source. There's a company called Mesosphere that's uh, commercializing that. That lets you take a big cluster and split it into lots of little clusters. Um, at the storage level, we, we tend to use uh, you know, what's out there. We use Hadoop file system a lot. We use Amazon S3 a lot, a bunch of other things. But we've built on top of that some of our own layers, including something called Tachyon, which is an in-memory cache that spreads across the cluster. It's now a company that's commercializing Tachyon called Tachyon Nexus. Uh, Spark, I'll talk a little bit about, but that's our processing engine. Uh, that's really the core of this thing. And then on top of that, you know, we have a bunch of different ways of getting into data. So um, GraphX is a graph processing system. MLBase is a, is a whole stack for doing machine learning. Um, BlinkDB is a system for doing approximate query processing. SampleClean is a system for bringing in the crowd to help you clean data incrementally uh, so that you can get better answers to your questions. And then we do a bunch of applications on top of this stuff uh, because we didn't want to wait for other people to build applications on it. So that's the badass stack. Um, at the heart of it is this thing called Spark. Let me just build this out. So um, Spark um, <coughs> was a project that started at the very beginning of the AMP Lab, actually started at the end of our previous project called Rad Lab. Um, and the, it, it, it's a great story, so I'll just tell it quickly. Um, Rad Lab was looking at building automated or autonomic computing systems. So the idea was you take computer systems people, you take machine learning people, um, and you get the computers to record a lot of telemetry and a lot of data about what's going on. You show that to the machine learning people. They build models that you can then use to self-drive self the, the, the computing systems. So we, we had this great group of people that were, um, you know, computer systems people that were very used to talking with machine learning people and vice versa. So when Hadoop started getting popular, some of the machine learning people started trying to implement some of their favorite algorithms on top of Hadoop, and a lot of them didn't work very well. They were very slow. And you know, they went over to the system side of the lab, and they said, hey, could you help us debug this? What are we doing wrong? <laughs> Systems people looked at it and said, mm, you're not really doing anything wrong. Um, and what was going on was that the algorithms that they were running were the iterative algorithms where you, know, you read in a bunch of data, you process it, you write out a bunch of data, and then you iterate. And Hadoop had no notion of this iteration. And so what would happen is every iteration would read from the disk, do the processing right to the disk. Next iteration, even though everything's already in memory, read from the disk, do the processing right to the disk. OK, so you're basically communicating through the slowest device you have in the, computer, in the data center, which is the disk. OK, it's not the right way to implement those. So Spark basically looked at that and said, OK, let's build a system that's smarter about how you leverage memory so that we can solve these kinds of problems. Then, of course, there's technical details about how you do that and remain fault tolerant and so on. But that's the basic idea. So when you do that, you end up going a lot faster than Hadoop, pretty easily 10 to 100 times on some important workloads. Uh, and then we put it out in open source, and I'll tell you about that in a second. Uh, but then it, it sort of took on a life of its own. Okay, and this is, uh, uh, this is a quote from uh, somebody at Goldman Sachs uh, at the last Spark Summit. It basically said, Spark is becoming the lingua franca of big data analytics. And I put that up there 
because for, lot, for, for many years, you know, lots of companies in, in Silicon Valley were using Spark for doing various things, and lots of scientists were using it. But when the banks started using it, that sort of showed to me that we sort of reached a new, a new uh, level of acceptance. So uh, anyway, so that's Spark. And you know, if you look, so this is the badass stack with the, with the covers removed. And um, basically, you know, resource virtualization, storage, so on. The way to read this thing is all the blue stuff are things that we've built in the lab. Everything else are stuff we use from somewhere else. Spark SQL was half, well, less than half the lab, but some of my students did it, so I take some of the credit for it. Um, but, but everything in red is, if you go and download Apache Spark, you get all the stuff in red. Okay, so that's what the stuff in red is. The stuff in blue are, are software systems that we've released like in the last month. So, um, you know, and so you'll notice that Spark is not really in the lab anymore. It's graduated. We've donated it to the Apache Foundation. There's a whole community out there that I'll tell you about in a second. And what we're doing in the lab is then building around that. So, you know, Succinct does uh, data compression on top of uh, the storage models. Um, you know, and, and I already told you a bunch of these things. Spark R is a, a, an, R, a, an interface from the statistical language R to the stack. Um, Keystone ML is a system we just released for, for doing data science pipelines. And Velox is a system for doing real-time uh, <coughs> machine learning. Okay? So as a research project, basically each one of these boxes is one or two PhD theses. That's kind of how it works. And there's a bunch of stuff that goes on in the lab that doesn't ever make it to this diagram. And that's okay. And so sort of the deal we make with the students is, you know, work on what you're going to work on, do your research. If you're interested in building a community and getting a lot of users, if you can figure out where in this kind of Tetris diagram your stuff fits, you know, and you can actually really get it to work with everything else, then, then you might want to spend some time doing that. Because then you'll get users, you'll get feedback, you'll get famous, you know, and so on. So that's kind of how we do it. That's a badass stack. And, you know, a lot of people ask me, well, how did this university project spark, you know, catch on? And, you know, part of the answer is it's the right idea at the right time. That always helps. But another part of the answer is that the students in particular worked really hard to get the word out, to build a community. So we started meetups. Uh, we started this thing called AMP Camp, where we would bring people in and give them tutorials on, on how to use the stack. We then started doing AMP Camp at popular events like Strata. Uh, eventually, um, the Spark community started this thing called Spark Summit, and it just kind of grew from there. Okay, but but the original um, meetup was was one group in San Francisco. You know, a couple dozen people sitting around a couple pizzas, right? And then it grew from there. Um, and so, if you look at what's going on with Spark, um, you know, this is kind of each month how many contributors there were. And if you look at the previous release, which was a couple months ago. Uh, there were 400 individual people that have code in that release of Spark. And so, you know, if you can get this kind of a community going, you can get tremendous leverage in terms of, of, of resources. Um, at the beginning of the year, um, this is what the Spark community looked like, at least in terms of meetups. There were 43 meetups uh, around the world in 14 different countries, about 12,000 uh, members. Um, a couple weeks ago, uh, it looked like this. Uh, now there's, uh, a, you know, 66 groups. So since January, it's increased by over 50%. Uh, now we're in 23 countries, and uh, you know, 75% increase in the number of members. And and this is actually at about 22,000. I looked at it this morning, but I didn't want to change the slide. So um, you know, once you can build that community, you know, you, you start getting this this kind of this kind of adoption. So, okay, um, I'm gonna skip that, sorry. Um, so just to kind of summarize on this, um, we've released a bunch of software, and then, you know, one thing, again, I, pro I, I warned you that I was gonna brag, um, you know, you might be thinking, well, geez, these guys are spending so much time with all these companies and building software, they must not have any time to do research. So, um, just to dispel that notion, the ACM announced their dissertation awards for you know, 2014. Um, two out of three of them came from our lab. So, uh, Matej Zaharia won the award overall. He's the guy who did Spark. John Ducci, uh, who's one of my Jordan students in the machine learning group, uh, you know, got one of the two honorable mentions. And my uh, obnoxious 
joke about this is you only get to nominate two people. <laughs> Otherwise, we, we maybe could have swept them. I don't know. But, um, you know, so, so the point here is partly to brag, but partly to say, look, if you think about it and you're careful, you can kind of thread this, 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 this narrow path between having real impact in the world and doing research that is acknowledged by the research community as being valuable, right? And it's not easy, and you gotta always figure out you know, which side of that road you're focused on, but, but you can do it. And that's another, another big point there. Um, so that's all I wanted to say about the AMP Lab. I'll say quickly about the Institute for Data Science, and I wanna talk about education. So um, AMP Lab is completely in a bit, it's in a room about this size, in a single building, that's what AMP Lab is, a little bigger than this. But um, the Berkeley Institute is, is, a, is the exact opposite of that. It's intended to be kind of across the entire campus. So um, it was started with this Morse Sloan grant that I talked about, but the idea is, you know, we wanted a place on campus where people who were doing data-driven science could come and get answers. Um, we wanted it to be kind of the center of activity on campus as the campus starts to embrace data science. Right, there was a place where, where you could go and meet people from all over campus who were working on data science and, and thinking about it. And then, you know, we actually wanted it to build some, some technology and, and some, you know, uh, educational tools as well. And so it started about a year ago. And I think, you know, the interesting thing about it is if you look at sort of the principal investigators, you know, they really come from, from all over campus. And so uh, the guy who runs it is Saul Perlmutter. He's in the physics department. He's a cosmologist. Um, but, you know, there's people from, you know, CS and from, you know, physics and, oh, I said physics, but, you know, public policy, stats, and so on. And so, um, because of its wide scope, you know, it doesn't quite yet have that set of accomplishments that I was able to tick through for AMPAD, which was much more focused. But, you know, it, 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 what it's done is it started a community, and there's a place now on campus where if you're, you know, working on, on a problem that you would like to, you know, get some help with for data science, or you think you want to contribute to data science, there's an obvious place on campus to go. Okay, and that's really what that is. In, 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 in All right, so I just mentioned that one. So let me just quickly talk about education and then hopefully have time for questions or two. So, um, yeah, the challenge is everyone needs data science. And if you look at, you know, sort of the traditional definition of data science, you know, it's some combination of, you know, you have to know stuff about computers, you have to know stuff about stats, you have to know stuff about a domain. And to me, the fundamental question is, is, is that what it is? You know, do I figure out which parts of computer science and which parts of stats and which parts of my domain I need and I, I, I glue those together and that's data science? Or, or is there something more there? Is there something intellectually uh, unique and, 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 and important about data science itself? Right, because that, that question gets to the heart of whether you need a data science department or a data science major or a college of data science or data science university or whatever, right? If, if the answer is no, it's, it's just a few pieces from a few different places, it's not clear you really need something new. But if there's something fundamentally new that needs to get built there, organizationally you need to think about what that's gonna look like on campus. Okay, my argument is not just CS and stats, right? And I already hinted at, at what I think is different. I think you have to really approach it from this life cycle point of view, right? And, and it's not just a bunch of individual technologies that you want to glue together, but you really need to, there's a whole set of processes, there's a whole way of thinking. Um, and importantly, it's not just to answer one question, but this is to manage all the data um, that you're gonna to need to answer all sorts of questions in the future, including questions you haven't even thought of yet. Okay, so I think one of the key things that's missing just by gluing stats and CS together is this idea of exactly what the data science life cycle is and, and how to support it. Data curation, sorry. Um, issues about structure, you know, the, 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 the current approach for big data, uh, for, 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 for unstructured data, did not really come out of universities. It really came out of people that were trying to solve real problems that were unhappy with the tools that they were given, you know, either by the existing open source or by the existing companies. And so, you know, Although data structures are certain, certainly things we teach in computer science and, and in the database course and so on, I think pulling out this idea of data as a first class citizen and, and data having a shape and a, and, a, and, a, and a life and a trajectory all on its own, pulling that out of computer science, at least partially, would, would, would be uh, 
rip, you know, would hugely uh, allow us to, to, to accelerate the, um, you know, uh, new techniques and, and new foundations and theory on that stuff. So, you know, I think that's something that, that could be pulled out. Um, we haven't talked about it all, but, you know, there's a lot of ethical problems, a lot of social questions uh, about collecting data and using data, and they're, not, they're unavoidable, right? And there are some technical solutions to some of these, but a lot of them we don't even know what we want yet. Like, if you could give us a magic policy box that could implement, you know, whatever policy we wanted, I don't think we could agree on what that policy should be. So, huge questions there. And then, you know, yeah, of course, as much as CS and stats. So, you know, somewhere in here, you know, and probably other things that I haven't thought of could be the start of a, of a new discipline. So, um, you know, where is this starting? At most places, like I said, you guys are ahead of just about most everyone I've talked to. Most places are starting with a master's degree because it's the easiest place to innovate on campus. Um, about a year ago, uh, a bunch of us pitched this idea to our chancellor and, and provost who are new on campus. And they liked the idea and they did what any good college administrator would do. They'd say, that's a great idea. Why don't you guys form a committee? <laughs> so we got put on the, the, not just any committee, it was the, the, the data science rapid action team. So <laughs> we were asked to actually move fast. And you know, basically the, the idea here is, it, you know, it's not just about physicists that are trying to you know, find supernovas, and it's not just about you know, people that are trying to sell ads online. You know, it's every person in the 21st century needs to be data literate. So how do we accomplish that? That's really the educational message. Message. The chancellor is very excited about it. He's been tweeting about it. Um, why is this important? So this is an example I used in my original talk. I've uh, edited it a little bit. So this is a screenshot from Fox News. This was right at the very beginning of Obamacare. There was a deadline of March 31st. Uh, they, there was a certain goal that had to be met. All right, and, and otherwise it was going to be a complete flop. And this is where we were just four days before that goal. As you can see. Obamacare is going to be a complete, horrible flop. All right, look at that. Well, here's what I hid from you. <laughs> okay, so the point of this is partly it's always fun to make fun of Fox News. I guess I need to realize I'm in Orange County. Maybe that doesn't work as well as it does in Berkeley. But, but, you know, that's not really the point. The point is that, you know, people are getting hit with stuff like this all the time, and not data scientists, but people that are trying to make decisions. And so, you know, how do you educate people to, to live in a world where they're getting hit like, like this all the time? Okay. And, and Fox, <laughs> Fox later did say, oh, you know, that was a mistake. <laughs> and they published, they published uh, one that actually had, I think, the same bars but had numbers next to them. So. Okay. All right. So, um, you know, on campus, here's what I'm facing. I'm chair of CS. Um, this is uh, 2010 fall. This is 2014 fall. We have two majors, an, uh, an engineering one and a letters and sciences one. Engineering one is capped on the way in, letters and sciences isn't, and you can see what's happening, and so uh, basically a doubling in four years, okay, of the number of, of, of majors in computer science, okay? Now this is deceptive because it turns out these people declare as freshmen, these people declare as juniors. So if you want to see where this is going, it's much, much, much worse. These are people that in the next year or two are going to try to get into the CS major. Okay? So just crazy explosion of interest in computer science. I don't think it's any different here. Is, yeah. that, is that Berkeley data or is that this, national data? This is Berkeley. This is just Berkeley. You think it's a bias because of the location or not really? From what people tell me, it's really not. But this is happening all over the place. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you look, um, th this is a bit of an eye chart, but same time period. Um, these are all the different courses that freshmen can take to learn about computing. And if you just add this up, we've got about 5,000 people a year uh, taking some sort of a freshman computing class. We get 6,000 freshmen. Okay? So, you know, the students are already voting. They feel like they need to learn this stuff. You know, if they can get it through computer science, they'll do that. If they can get it by taking the, the, the stats class that teaches computation, they'll do that. You know, or math class or whatever. But the students have decided they need to learn about computation. And we think they're, they're also deciding they need to learn about data. So there's this huge undergraduate push. And so what the Rapid Action, Action Committee came up with was, <laughs> like any good committee, a 45-page report. Um, <laughs> but what's in that report, and it's not released yet, but it, I think it is going to be released for the public pretty soon, basically um, an argument for why you need to teach data science to all undergraduates. And then um, a way of doing that is a single class 
so that they at least get exposed to data science and then a major and a minor, and then some thoughts about where it might go from there. So that's what's in the, that report. Um, the thing I want to show you really is this, because this is what's unique. So the idea is that there should be a class that any freshman, any freshman, no matter what their major, could take, okay, that's going to teach them about working with data. And so, you know, some fundamental concepts about some simple programming with Python, uh, you know, graphing data, understanding statistics, you know, here's two distributions, or, or here's two data sets, did they come from the same underlying distribution or not, right, you do A-B testing and so on. So kind of walk people through these concepts using computation more than using, say, math. Okay, although the math is there in the background, it's not in the foreground. And then the key innovation, so you, you try to do that for freshmen. And the key innovation is this idea of connectors, is then you have like a half a class that then, you know, for the person who's gonna be a computer science major, they take the computer science connector, right? That takes this information and then adds more programming. You know, for the person who's gonna be a business major, you bring in you know, more of the business analysis. You know, for the person who's gonna be a social science major, you bring in more about how do you do data-driven uh, data social science. Okay, so that's the main thing that was in that report that's being acted on. Um, we're teaching a version of this foundation course and a couple connectors this coming fall to about 150 people. We're gonna to try to scale it up to 500 in the spring and then we'll see where it goes from there, okay? And then in terms of the major and the minor, um, you know, you guys already did this. You already created that major. We haven't taken that step yet. So we're trying to figure out what needs to be in that major. Um, and we could have a discussion about that. I wanna, I wanna wrap up and hope they have time for questions. So um, I'll just summarize, you know, the main point I wanna get across is don't let the hype scare you. Um, things are fundamentally changing and, and you know, you should embrace it, not, not run from it. Uh, and that um, big data and open source are providing new ways for university researchers to do data, to, to do work that's immediately relevant, you know, in the real world, okay? And if that's something that you like, it's a great opportunity. Um, we gotta figure out how to teach people data science on campus, we gotta figure out where that is. And then, you know, I think the underlying question that I certainly didn't answer, but that as a group we're gonna have to answer in the long run, is, is this a new field? You know, just the way computer science grew out of, you know, math departments and double E departments, you know, however many years ago, before my time. Um, you know, or is this just a few, couple, a couple classes we need to create and put a bow around? And I think that's a deeper question that we're going to have to think about. So with that, I will stop. Open them up for questions. Yeah, so the master's program that, that's currently at Berkeley, the data science master's program, is run by the iSchool, and that's an online, it's not a MOOC, but it's online. And so the way they handle communication is that it's not a MOOC. So, so they have mechanisms in place for, for doing that. I think the reason they went with online is because there was so much industry interest in that, that, you know, but, you know, it, yeah. Yes? You there is you can do a parallel with what happened with uh, Linux years ago, uh -huh. uh, open source, they push out Unix, Unix companies. Uh, do you think that is something happening now with uh, big data, Hadoop, and this technology? Yeah, that's a really that's a really good question. So you know, is this open source stuff, Hadoop and Spark and whatever your favorite open source system, is that pushing out the existing uh, commercial vendors? And I think I think the answer is that it, it's definitely. It's definitely taking part of their business and it's gonna increasingly take more and more of it. But there's a bunch of things that people do with data that aren't analytics um, that I don't yet see any open source projects that people are gonna trust enough to, to build completely on that. So, you know, that's sort of the different, what the, you know, an interesting question to me is, is why did open source get such a foothold in, in, in big data analytics? And I think the answer was that, at least initially, um, a lot of the questions people were asking, it was okay if you missed some of the data, right? Which is not true in a lot of business environments. And that people weren't using um, this data as like the system of record. So they weren't doing you know, transaction stuff on it. 
And I think that stuff is not really currently in danger of being, you know, taken out by open source. I think a lot of the analytics, underlying analytics stuff, uh, absolutely. Uh, this, the open source stuff is really catching up. And, and those companies are, are, are trying to adapt. Yeah? A follow up on that question. Uh, would things would have been different if, uh, for example, a company like Oracle would have come up with Hadoop before it became open source? Uh, something like a Hadoop like a system would have become not an open source? Not yeah, open source. wow. Yeah, so so if, if, but I mean, and try to sell it as a commercial? Yes. Okay, so the truth is, as Mike Carey will happily tell you, database systems have been doing that stuff for decades, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, the parallel processing and, I mean, that stuff's always been there. And so I think that, I think that the answer then is no. I mean, those companies did have that kind of technology. It wasn't packaged exactly the same way, so it was harder to use. But even then, it, it didn't really just, it just didn't take off. Uh, in the same way. And so I think the fact that it was open source combined with the availability of, of public cloud computing, that's the other thing that was missing, right? That you didn't need to build a big data center to do this kind of stuff. It was a combination of those two things that really caused this to, to, to take off. And, and without either of those, I don't think it would have. I mean, but what, you know, what do I know? <laughs> it might, it's just a guess. What are your thoughts about educating students about big data? Because you mentioned that you get a lot of really useful results when you draw big data set, yep. but then you can't really give every student yes. you know, a really big machine yep. Yep. To, to run experiments. Right. So good. So so you know, in the education sense, or you know, in the education story, you know, how much you know, where does data science and, and big data in the sense of you know big being lots of data, where where do those two things fit? And this is actually something I learned um, from teaching with, with Jeff Hammelbach at, at the very beginning of, of all this from my perspective, was, um, you know, my thought was we would, of course, do the data science course with Hadoop, or, or at the time, you know, Spark was sort of just starting, uh, and maybe Spark. And Jeff sort of was very insistent, saying, no, 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 there's a whole bunch of things that people need to learn about working with data that you can do just on a laptop with actually a fairly small data set. And so the way we've been teaching that particular class is, you know, the first sort of three quarters to 80% of the course is all just done on laptops with Python and, and, small, and R and small data sets. And then the very, at the very end, we give them an assignment where they try to scale that up to, to bigger data. And so at least they get the feel for what changes when you go from a laptop to, to, to a bigger system. That doesn't get at your point, which is, at what point do you, do you start seeing these new insights? But I think the answer to that is that for education, at least, you can probably construct the right set of data sets and, 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 and exercises that could at least show that amount of discovery so that as you go from tiny data to a little bit bigger data, you start seeing new things. And so I think pedagogically, as I like to say, that, that, that'll probably work. But the key thing that I learned was you don't have to throw people you know, into Hadoop to teach them data science. You really, and, they, and you probably shouldn't. You should probably save that for later. Before we let you escape, I just want to put in a plug. There's a data science event this afternoon over in Cal IT2. Uh, Chris Ray from Stanford is here, and is going to be giving a keynote at that event. And that starts at 3. Uh, Rory can tell you more if you catch him yeah, online. He, he promised to be more technical. And so Mike is here now also to hear that talk. Uh, and he'll be over there, so if you want to ask him more questions, you can probably find him over here later in the afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you.